Let me ask you a question. Is it wise or foolish to be overly trusting? Now, don't answer that one. Because, see, I set you up on that first one, and I told you I'd never do that, so I'm sorry. I'll print, repent of that. Is it wise or foolish to be overly trusting? If you're thinking in your mind that it is foolish to be overly trusting, you're wrong. Almost every study shows that people who are overly trusting are happier people, and they're happy in the lives that they live. People who are overly trusting are willing to extend grace and give people a second and third chance. And that's what God calls us to do. And if we're going to have a relationship that lasts like the relationship that God wants us to have, we've got to extend a lot of grace. And we've got to give people a lot of slack because we need it ourselves. Thirdly, lasting love, write this down, expects the best. Paul said it always hopes. Now, one translation says it always expects the best. The message says it always looks for the best. Now, now think about those two statements. That's so profound. What if you and I, with our spouses or with other relationships at work or in our family, what if we always expected the best out of someone? And what if we always just look for the best instead of looking for the worst? Would that change? Wouldn't that change in, in that triangle? See, if we did that, if we acted like, like the Lord would, would have us to act, and you know why that's important? Because people have a tendency to live up to what others expect out of them. Did you know that? Bruce Wilkerson wrote a book entitled The Prayer of Jabez, and he, he's done some other things as well, and we're not here to discuss that particular book. But years ago, when he first, after he finished a lot of his schooling, he was a professor out in a college in, in uh, Oregon. And he went into the, fac the faculty lounge with the beginning of school, and they were having some pre-days with all the professors. And one of the professors looked at his schedule, and he said, Oh, Bruce, you lucky thing. You have two Section A classes. He said, what does that mean? He said, well, in the Section A classes, we put some of our brightest students in those classes. You're going to love those. The students are bright. They're attentive. They want to be there. You're going to love them. And he said, you know what? During that term, he was right. They were the two best classes I had. The students seemed to be more alert. They wrote more. They wrote better. At the end of the term, we were back in the faculty lounge, and I was talking to another faculty member, and I said, man, I hope I get some more Section A classes this term. He said, Bruce, we don't have any Section A classes. He said, yeah, we do. I had two of them. He said, Bruce, we stopped that program five or six years ago. He said, I went back and looked at a lot of their papers and their term papers. And sure enough, they were better than the other classes. They had lived up to my expectations. We just finished the NCAA basketball tournament. Who won the thing? Connecticut. Does everybody say, who won it? Now, a lot of you, where you are, you were probably in some uh, bracket where you were just picking against it. Carolyn and I have been in one for several years, and we don't put any money on it because I lose every time. But at any rate, how many of you put down that Connecticut will win the national championship? Now, be honest. Anybody in here write down Connecticut? I, I think I saw where the millions of people that put it in, there was like uh, a couple hundred that actually picked Connecticut to win it. Did you ever see the Connecticut coach interviewed on TV? If you watched any of the games or if you watched it at halftime, I can remember at the halftime of one particular game, they went up and asked the coach. They were trailing by 10 or 12 points at halftime, and they were pointing out something that was going wrong on the team. And here was his response. He said, you know, we talked about that at halftime, and we're going to correct that the second half, and we're going to win. Almost every time he was asked anything, 
he gave a positive response. Did you know that the week before the tournament began, or it might have been a little more than a week, they went down two teams in their conference. One is in Houston, the University of Houston. One is in Dallas, SMU. And both of those teams beat Connecticut by more than 20 points. The week before the tournament began. And you know what he did with his players? He took them over to that huge arena in Dallas that there were, ended up being more than 79,000 people in that arena watching the semifinals of that game. And he told his guys, this is where we'll be for the final four and we'll be playing for the national championship. They lived up to his expectations. Now, I tried that once coaching a high school, Mike. It didn't work for me. I told but you understand the point? People have a tendency. We need to be careful saying, you always do so-and-so, or you never do that, or you will never be, because what we're doing is programming somebody. And if we're not careful, they'll live up to our expectation. Now, how does that fit into the triangle? Real easily. Others may not expect the best out of me. Others may not uh, encourage me, but I can expect the best out of others. And I can encourage others. Now, what does that do to our relationship? Together, it, it changes. Come on, let's say it together. It, it really does. It really does. And finally, the fourth thing is to make lasting love like God. And write this down. The scripture says, love always perseveres. That's the NIV version. One translation says, love never gives up. Never gives up. Write this down. Love endures the worst. Now, it's important that you write that down. Because it's easy to endure the best, isn't it? See? But love endures and perseveres even through the worst. Rick Warren, who a lot of the information that I shared with you in the last four weeks I, I got from Rick, Rick said that he, he was in theological school in Dallas somewhere and he sat down with his wife and he said honey I think God wants us to go to California and start a church he was just finishing his theological school he said now here's the problem we don't have any money no church has offered to hire us we don't have any support and I've never been a senior pastor before or a pastor or a preacher going out to start up a church what do you think? Love always what? Trust? Persevere? She said, honey, I believe in God and I believe in you. And if that's where God's leading us, let's go. What if they hadn't have gone? They have over 100,000 people on their church roll. I don't know how many of you, how many of you know the name Rick Warren? You remember the book, The Purpose Driven Life? You know how many copies of Purpose Driven Life they sold? Over how many? Anybody? Over 15 million copies. He became an instant multimillionaire. Now, I want to tell you something about, about Rick Warren that makes me love him and appreciate him so much. One of the very first things that he did was to come back. Now, remember, he started the church from scratch by knocking on doors and inviting people to come and hear about Jesus. Was that he paid the church back every dime that he'd ever received in salary. And then he started projects in third world countries. He's helped to train over, I don't know how many hundreds of ministers and pastors that have gone out into the world to do mission work. His goal is to die broke. He sat with his wife and they went out. God led him into this. He said, I used to do a lot of marital counseling when he said, I don't do it anymore. He, he can't. How could you possibly do marital counseling for a 100,000 member church? But he said, you know what I found? He said, when my wife and I first got married, he said, it was like hell on earth. He said, I'm serious. And he said, I was Satan. And they were in theological school. He was. And he said, well, he sat down with my wife. We've been married a couple of years, and I can tell you, Carolyn and I can identify with that. We got married too young. We had children too quickly. 
We had a bunch of children quickly. And he said, we talked about it, and we said, number one, the very first thing we made a decision on, the big D word would never be in our vocabulary. Carolyn and I did the same thing. The word divorce was never mentioned in our home. We never, that was never considered. Our children never heard us mention that word other than, than in some other context. And he said, let me tell you, almost every problem that I ever dealt with in marital counseling and what I dealt with myself, he said, he said probably three things caused almost every single problem, pride, ego, and selfishness. He's probably pretty close to being right. And he said, we decided, he said, I knew what I needed to do. And my wife knew what she needed to do. And said, we summed up our problems in marriage with just two words. Now, don't get mad at me. I'm just quoting Rick Warren. He said, those two words, grow up. Get rid of the pride, the ego, the selfishness. Three words that ought to be taken out of our vocabulary, I, me, and mine, needs to change to we and us and together. And it's amazing what it'll have. These principles, how do those things fit in with the triangle? It fits so perfectly. Let me tell you, that triangle is the best single thing that I have ever seen in my life to help with relationships, whether it's at church, whether it's at work, whether it's in the family, and whether it's in marriages or not. We can have a lasting love like God has. In 1989, a lady by the name of Norma Cornett, I think, and I'm not sure how she pronounces her last name, wrote a poem. And the words of that poem and song go something like this. You just watch it on the screen. It's entitled, If I Knew It Would Be the Last Time. If I knew that it would be the last time that I'd see you fall asleep, I'd tuck you in more tightly and pray the Lord would keep your soul. If I knew it would be the last time that I'd see you walk out that door, I would give you a hug and kiss, and I'd call you back for just one more. If I knew it would be the last time I'd hear your voice lifted up in praise, I would tape each word and action and play them back throughout my day. For surely, there's always tomorrow. And we always get a second chance to make everything right. There will always be another day to say, I love you. And certainly, there's always another chance to say, is there anything I can do for you? But just in case, I might be wrong. And today is all I get. I'd like to say how much I love you and hope that we never forget. Tomorrow's not promised to anyone, young or old. And today may be the last chance that you get to hold your loved one tight. So if you're waiting for tomorrow, then why not do it today? For if tomorrow never comes, you'll surely regret one day that you didn't take the extra time or smile or hug or a kiss. And if you were too busy to grant someone what turned out to be their one last wish, 
So hold your loved one close today. And then whisper in their ear that you love them very much. And that you'll always hold them dear. Take the time to say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Or thank you. It's okay. And if tomorrow never comes, you'll have no regret about today. You just stand. How deep Father's love for us. Just listen to the words of the song. Our Father's love. Father, oh, how I pray that we would really learn to love like Jesus loves. How I pray, Father, that, that each of us would be willing to change and not wait for the other person to change. Father, how I wish that we would extend so much grace that we would extend as much grace as you've extended to us. God, I pray that you'll help us to persevere always always look for the best. When I need to remember how much Jesus loved me, help me to remember the event that occurred almost 2,000 years ago. Yeah.